Genesis chapter 19. This is from our portion last week. This is a text that bothered the sages. Because we have what is called the two powers in heaven. So right up front here I'm going to speak about three things that are, that are difficult when we look at the world of traditional religion. Look at uh, verse, this is in the context of Sodom and Gomorrah. Verse 24 says this, Then, and I'm going to just read it, Then the yod heh vav -Heh rained brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah from the yod heh vav -Heh out of the heavens. So there's a yod heh vav -Heh on the ground, and there's a yod heh vav -Heh in the heavens. You have a problem. We have two yod heh vav -Hehs there. So here's the issue within modern Judaism and within Christianity. That Yeshua is the physical representation of yod heh vav -Heh. He, is, he has yod heh vav -Heh inside him. Now, interestingly enough, my brothers and sisters within Judaism don't want Yeshua. They want yod heh vav -Heh. And my brothers and sisters in the Christian church don't want yod heh vav -Heh. They want Yeshua. And yet, they are one. So this creates a dilemma. People say, well, we have to wait until we get to the New Testament in order to have Yeshua. No, you don't. If yod heh vav -Heh is in Yeshua, then anywhere you see yod heh vav -Heh, you're also seeing Yeshua. Or vice versa. Okay? This is high Christology. That Yeshua is the physical representation, the physical manifestation of yod heh vav -Heh on the ground. And believe me when I say that this is going to become, and has already become, the main issue that's out there. And you hear it very subtly when people say this. The God of the Old Testament. As soon as you hear God of the Old Testament, my, the question that comes up is, well, do we have a different God on the other side? Is he a different God on this side? That's fundamental. If we're going to say that we're monotheists, that Yahweh resides within Yeshua, that Yeshua can say things like, if, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I'm the physical representation of this one. There's not going to be this bifurcation. Although, we're going to have to use language that talks about two. For instance, we're going to get to Daniel chapter 7, and it's going to say, and this is another text that bothered the rabbinic sages. We have text in the Hebrew scripture that says there is a throne in heaven. Singular. But we get to Daniel chapter 7 and it says there were thrones in heaven. Whoa, put on the brakes. We got thrones up there? He's looking up in this night vision. He says, I see thrones. And he says, I see this ancient of days. It's all Aramaic, mind you. And then I see this bar inash, this one like a son of man. Uh oh I've got a son of man, and I've got the Ancient of Days, and there's thrones. And they're both up there in this heavenly realm. So this is the fundamental issue that's out there on the table. Second fundamental issue, and this is, the, also, the big, this is also the big stumbling block. And it makes sense because one, they're, they're, they're tied to each other. And I see my evangelical brothers choke all over this one. They talk around it. They, they dance around it. They know that they can't do too much with it, but then they don't know what to do with it. And so there's, here's, the big, here's the big elephant in the room. What do we do with the Torah? Because it looks like, at some places, that the new, it looks like, some places in the New Testament, that it's done away with, it's just abolished. And yet at other times, it looks like it's still going on. So there's this continuity and discontinuity. Well, what do we do with it? Do we throw it all out? 
do we take it all in, or do we just kind of treat it like a buffet and, and piece it out however we all want to? We all get to walk the line and go, well, I think I should be moral, but nah, I don't know about ethical. And I don't want any of that. I'll take a little bit of that. I think there should be some of that. And then we treat it like this buffet that we get to choose. And if we don't like that, we can call the, we can call the head waiter and say, look, I don't like what's on the buffet. Can I replace it with something else? Well, sure, we'll let you replace it. What would you like? Well, I don't like this. I like all the ten. I mean, the ten makes sense to me, except for the Sabbath. It just doesn't make sense to me that God would want us this day. Why does he care what day? So can I change it for Sunday? I'd like to ch change it out for Sunday. Well, sure, we'll change it out for you. We'll bring out some Sunday for you. Anything else you'd like to change? Well, sure, while I'm at it. And then we just start doing changes and, and mixing and matching. And then we build a whole new, whole new paradigm. We say, look, I don't want holy days. I want holidays. I don't want to meet with other people when God said to meet. I just as soon meet with my office buddies. And we'll have some holidays. And we'll mix and match. And we'll kind of, we'll kind of put it all together. We'll call it a, a, a goulash. You know, we'll, we'll have it a salad. We'll bring it all together. And by the way, salad is another word for, hold on, syncretism. Syncretism. S-Y-N-C-R-E-T-I-S-M. It's when we do this. So we turn on our radio and you hear this. And we, we end up with syncretism when people say, have to say things like this. Here's the real reason for the season. Well, if the real reason for the season was, was patently obvious, we wouldn't have to say there's a real reason for the season. It would, be, it would be so blatantly obvious, nobody would even have to say that. But when I turn on my Christian radio, and it says this, you know, I saw mommy kissing Santa Claus, and then the next song is, then the next song is, Oh, holy night, the stars were brightly... I'm going, I saw mommy kissing Santa Claus, Oh, holy night. Which of these things just doesn't belong there? <laughs> Hello? You know, I'm sitting there going, I got some cognitive dissonance here. And I think that the world, looking at Christianity from the outside in, goes, what are they doing? What are they doing? I mean, one time it's, you know, it's, it's you know, oh, holy night. Okay, I get that. But then follow that up with, I saw mommy kissing Santa Claus. It creates all kinds of, all kinds of difficulty. And I don't mean to be funny with this. I'm just saying this is where we're at. What do we do with the commandments? What do we do with Yeshua? Is he the living God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Yeah. What do we do with the, what do we do with the Torah? So what do we do with Yeshua? What do we do with the Torah? These are the two fundamental questions that are on the table that are always going to be on the table. And we have to struggle with both of these issues. Because they're, both of those are constantly under barrage and attack. And leading evangelicals, leading evangelicals are writing books on these two topics. They're, they're perpetuating more and more books in these areas. Now here's the other one. Here's the third area now. So we have, and these are all tied together. First I have... The, I have the issue of who Yeshua is. Who's his identity? Then I have the issue of the Torah. Is it a buffet that I get to pick and choose? Do I throw it all out? Do I take it all in? What do we do with it? And then we have the third issue. We've talked about this one before. The church I came from. And I'll only speak about the church I came from because then I can, I can talk about it because I lived in that church for a long time. My father was an associate pastor of that church for a long time. My mom still attends that church. I was at that church this summer. And here's what, here's what things are about. We have over a thousand plus people in the auditorium on any, given, on any given Sunday. And the message goes something like this almost every Sunday. Since I've been going there and, and everything, everything I listen, it's like this. You are a dirty, rotten sinner. You, have, you are, because you are a sinner, you are going to hell because that's where you go. That's where sinners go. And because you're going to hell, 
it's a good thing for you that Jesus Christ came to die on the cross for you, because it's all about you, and he is going to take you to heaven when you die if you'll just simply say a prayer. All you need to do is say this prayer. I'm going to pray the sinner's prayer. I want you to lift your hand if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, and accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, and that way when you die, you won't go to hell. You'll go, he'll take you to heaven when you die. Because after all, it's about you. They don't say it that way. But. And then there's five things we want you to do. Once you become a Christian, there's, we're going to give you a little... You, when you come down forward after you've said the sinner's prayer, we're going to give you a, a, a pamphlet that's going to tell you how to walk the Christian life. And here's what we want you to do. Here's what the pamphlet says. Come to church every Sunday. Give a little money in the, in the plate when it's passed. Invite other people to church. Read your Bible every day. And pray every day. There you go. You're good to go. Then you can pretty much, well, no, we don't say it this way, but you can pretty much live your life the way you want to. From here on out. Because you got your, you got your, you're good to go. You got your good to go sticker. Okay? You can come across the bridge anytime you want to. We'll just debit the money out. It comes out of Jesus' account. And so, there you go. You can come and go as you please. That's all you have to do. You just get on the highway and travel. Doesn't matter what you do, doesn't matter, he doesn't care. There's only one fundamental problem with that. First of all, well, there's a number of problems with it, but first of all, it's not about you. I hate to say that. Salvation isn't about you. Surprise, right? Salvation is about him. This was the eternal plan of God long before any of us ever came along. So it was always about him. But not only that, Yeshua never says to people, come and accept me as your personal Savior. And fill out a card and say a sinner's prayer. What he does say is this. Yeshua is always, and this is what we have to get back to, he's always talking about the kingdom of God. Listen to Yeshua. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Seek first the kingdom. Pray this way. May your kingdom come i.e., your will be done. I think that may go back to the Torah we talked about earlier. Just a skosh. He's always talking. Let me tell you the parables of the kingdom. It's always about a coming king and advancing the cause of his kingdom. And the reason he redeems you and I is so that we can be a part of that kingdom. That we become members of the kingdom. Not so that we get to say, well, I now I'm, I'm, just, I'm going to heaven when I die. I, I got my get out of hell free card. I told you last week I saw a bumper sticker. No, this is how reductionistic we've become. It said, um, John, it said uh, get out of hell free, John 3.16. That's what the bumper sticker said. Get out of hell free, John 3.16. We've reduced the gospel to get out of hell free. What's interesting, though, is the good news, the euangelion, if you listen to Isaiah, where the, where the term first occurs, is this. Isaiah 52, 7 says, here's the good news. Your God reigns. That's the good news. The good news is this, that because Yeshua has come, he is going to take back the, this earth, and no longer will there be demonic forces, no longer will there be disease, no longer will there be death, and the earth will be made new again. That's good news. That's what he's coming to do. He's coming to bring his dominion, his sovereignty, his rule, his kingdom here, and make this a new place where we can all be with him and live here on this earth with him been saying this for a while too you know there's nothing in the bible that says we go to heaven it says he comes here if you know, look at the look at the hebrew scriptures all the way through it all the way through the scriptures it's all about him coming here he keeps coming here he goes back comes down goes back comes down he never takes us there he always keeps coming down because that's the model all right, anything about what I've said up to this point? I, I know I've said a lot, so just I've opened up a lot of can of worms, but that's okay. Yeah, anybody, any questions, comments, or? <laughs> no. no. <laughs> well, there's, it's recorded. Anybody else? Any, any comments, or, or? These are, by the way, those are, these are major issues. 
These are huge issues. Because any one of those three that we get wrong puts us on a path that's, that's problematic to the hilt and skews everything. If we don't understand who Yeshua is, if we don't understand that salvation is the kingdom of God coming, and if we don't understand that the Torah has a place in our lives, all three of those... Now, I want to make this point. This is an important point to make, and we, as a Messianic movement, have to keep making this point. With, with regards to the Torah, with regards... We're, going to read the, we're, going to, we're getting ready to read the Torah right now, in just a moment, or comment on it. With regard to the commandments, the commandments don't save you. One is never saved by keeping the commandments. One is never saved by doing good works. Salvation is always by grace through faith. Now, once you are a believer, once you have expressed faith in the living God, then the charter for how you are to live your life in the kingdom is the commandments. Think about this. If we take away all the commandments, let's say we get rid of all of them. They're all gone. If we do that, we have done damage to the issue of salvation because what does, what does Yeshua say? Repent. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What is there to repent of if there's no commandments? Amen. We get rid of sanctification if there's no commandments because how am I supposed to become more like him if everything he's told me to do is no longer in effect? And we do damage eschatologically because how is there going to be any judgment if there's no commandments? In other words, I've said it this way before. If a police officer pulls you over and there's no law backing his pulling you over, there's no, there's no point in him doing this. He pulls you over and says, well, you were speeding. You say, well, there's no, there's no speed limit. I can just go as fast as I want. There's no law. So how can you tell me that I, I was speeding? Because there, there's no standard. I can go as fast as I want. He says, no, 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 there's a sign right here that says it's you know, 45 miles an hour. You were going 50. I said, well, that was just a suggestion. That was just a recommended speed. That's what I say. It was like an idea. It was a good idea. Don't get me wrong. I told you before, no lie, I got pulled over. I've been pulled over many times. Although I've, I have repented, mostly. <laughs> yeah, I have repented mostly. And I got pulled over in the squim area. I was going... I was going um, 50, 50 miles an hour. No, so 55. I was going 55. And the guy pulls me over. Now, there's nobody behind me for miles. Nobody in front of me for miles. We're out in Squim. Hello. I'm driving along. 55. I, I had buried the needle on 55. He pulls me over and he says to me, they always do this. I lo they love this. They go, do you know how fast you were going? And you always have to, they want you to admit that you were... And I said, well, I said, I was going 55. He says, that's exactly right. He said, if you had lied to me, I was going to write you a ticket. He says, do you know what the speed limit is? And I said, 55. And he says, no, 50. I said, okay. So he was bored, basically. There was nobody out there. Was, we, we, he and I were alone. I mean, we're like, no, no traffic coming by. I'm like, he's probably going, I better pull somebody over. You know, next guy that's even over 50, I'm pulling over. I don't care. You know, so, all right. But if there's no commandment, if there's no law, he can't pull me over. So if there's, no, if there's no commandments, none, then we have no eschatological judgment. We have nothing to repent for on the front end. We have nothing to sanctify us in the middle. And we have nothing to be afraid of in the judgment on the end. Hold on, there was a question back here. Right. Yes, they use that analogy. Now, here's the problem with that. The only time, and by law, by law, the only time that a police officers are supposed to speed by law is if they're in pursuit. So we only give them, some, now, we know, I know, I'm sure that I have some police, I have a police officer friend I play pickleball with. I'm sure that he has put the lights on, although this is illegal to do. If they get caught doing this, it's illegal. If they get caught putting on the lights or the siren in order to do personal business or to take a break or to take a lunch break, and they just want to get people out of their way, and they're not on a call to do that, and they get caught, which getting caught is another whole story. Who's going to pull them over? Um, they 
Yeah, so, so yes, they can do this, but I know that he's probably turned on the lights or the siren to go to a, to a, to a coffee break or, you know. Um, but if they do that, we, to get his donuts, yeah. But donuts are not an emergency. Oh, well, I, I don't know. Donuts are very important. So one might make an exception there, but, but the, yeah, the Krispy Kreme. All right. But the point is that, that we give him, we the people, in, that's, well, that's where it's different. The people are in power of the police. And so we say to them, you can't, you can't speed unless you have an emergency that's been called in. Yes, then you can flip the lights on. Then you can turn the siren on. But other than that, you have to obey the speed limit as well. We do the same thing for my, my friend Earl is a, is a fireman. So we allow firemen to go faster in order to get to an emergency. Yes. And everybody ha- but then what we say is everybody else needs to get out of the way. Okay. So for that reason, we're going to clear the street and let everybody, everybody move to the right and get out of the way of an ambulance or a fireman or a policeman. That's the, so the, we don't create havoc and all kinds of problems. So, but we, the people, empower them to do that because they're, they're, we're paying them so that they'll come to, for, to our aid in an emergency. And we're thankful that they do. I appreciate our emergency personnel. Yes? And then that would go to what Paul says, should we sin that grace may abound? Yes, yes, I've had police officers let me go. They, they have that discretion where they can say, all right, look, don't do it anymore. Um, you know, you, you were in, you know we'll, give you, we'll give you a little bit of grace. Don't do it anymore. Okay, keep it, in the, keep it within the limit. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I am. Yes. As a matter of fact, I am. In that department, I tend to be very slow. Although, I've got to tell you, see, see here's, the dif- here's the difference now. i tell you what's changed me. i tell you what's changed me, at least a little bit. Well, tickets changed me, but that's another whole story. But no, these cameras that are everywhere now. See, we're being watched, right? And now that we know that we're being watched with all these cameras, you know that they're taking your picture, you start to think to yourself, you know what, I don't, know, I don't want to gun this because... Somebody's watching. There's a camera that's going to take a picture of this. How many pictures have you had? I've had a couple. <laughs> I've had a couple of pictures, so I know these pictures. So. Yeah, that's that's bare minimums. No, that's not true. Go ahead. That's what I'm saying. If you don't have anything, if there's never been a transgression, if you don't have commandments, you have no transgression. Ergo, you have nothing to repent of. By the way, when you become a believer, then if there's no commandments, there's, then there's nothing by which one knows what God wants. You know, and we have to keep saying this as well. You know, just, on the, just on the numbers of it, 79%, 79% of our Bible is the Hebrew Scriptures. So... This notion that you know the other you know the other twenty one percent can be just can do away with the seventy nine percent it just makes no sense. So this is why we see them using their using the scriptures over and over again, quoting them, alluding to them, echoing them. We've got to move on. All right, this is from our portion today, chapter twenty four. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I like that. I think there's some truth to that. I like that approach. Although, understand this. Again, I want to make this point. Keeping the commandments doesn't make God love me any more than he already does. It's not, keeping commandments doesn't make God love me any more than he does. What it does do is it demonstrates a willingness in my heart to bend to his sovereignty. Obedience demonstrates a willingness to bend the knee to the sovereignty of God. It doesn't make him say, you know, you're now more saved, or I love you more, or you're more favored. When my children are obedient, it's at, that, it's at those times that I want to do more for them. When my children are disobedient, it's at those times that discipline comes in 
and there's that feeling of alienation. They have the choice to be obedient or not to be obedient. It doesn't make them not my child. And I don't love them any less when they're obedient versus disobedient. But it does put a strain on the relationship. When I, have to, when I had to firm up and say, okay, no, this is the way it's going to be, whether you liked it or not. So there are times when you have to say, no, this is the way things need to be, because you're the parent. It doesn't make them any less your children. It doesn't make you love them or dislike them any, any more. It can put a strain on the relationship. So why do parents give commandments? Parents give commandments all the time because they want to provide protection and they want to provide security and they want to do right by them. They want to make sure that they have a quality of life and a quantity of life. Why does God give us commandments? For the very same reasons. For the very same reasons. And understand this. Here's the thing. If we believe that God is good, if we believe that God is good, he will never ask us to do anything that will harm us. He's never going to say, I want you to do something that's going to harm you. He's always going to do that which will protect us and will give us a quality of life and a quantity of life. I come that you might have life. If you do these things, you'll live better and longer. Theoretically. Now, admittedly, death has its place because of our rebellion. When we rebel, yes, there are problems. So let's look at our text. Our next Torah portion, which is actually chapter 24. I said last week, why did Sarah die? She probably died because Abraham comes back and tells her what he's been doing. And she just, the the text says, and, and Sarah died. I said last week that I don't know a guy that's been married for any length of time. I don't know a guy that's been married for any length of time that doesn't have some secrets from his wife. Just the way it is. Yeah, every guy is here going, I don't have a secret. Not me. Yeah. And every woman who's been married knows that her husband keeps secrets from her. Whatever it might be. And that doesn't always mean it's something bad. It just... My, my father, a blessed memory, when my mom died, she says, you're not going to believe all the stuff I found out about your father after he died. <laughs> all this stuff he kept from me. I went through all his stuff and found this and found that. I didn't know he knew this person or knew that person. Didn't know all this stuff. So guys are notorious for keeping secrets. Women know this. But by the way, because we keep these secrets, we generally tend to die earlier. We keep it all bottled in. You women are let, let it all out. You guys are talking and having fun. And, you know, you'll get mad and get upset, but you talk it out and you're done. Guys will be like, no, we're bottling it all up. In this sense, it's though Sarah dies at the age of 127. She precedes Abraham. So this is chapter 24. Our Torah text opens by informing us that Abraham is growing older, but growing weak in body, has not caused him to forget the covenant, given him many years earlier. What covenants are we talking about? What are, the, what are the, basic, the basic substructure of the Hebrew Scriptures? I've been saying this for a long time. Everything that God does and everything that God says is foundationed in covenants. There are five basic covenants. There's the five basic. We have the Noahic covenant. What's the sign of the Noahic covenant? Rainbow. Rainbow. We have the Abrahamic covenant. What's the sign of the Abrahamic covenant? Circumcision. We have the Mosaic covenant. What's the sign of the Mosaic covenant? Shabbat, Sabbath. We have the Davidic covenant. What's the sign of the Davidic covenant? A crown, David. Somebody's going to be on the throne. A throne, a crown. And what's the, then we have the new covenant, Jeremiah 31. What's the new covenant? The new covenant is the Torah written on the heart. Torah written on the heart. So now we're in the Abrahamic covenant. So there's the five basic structure of the Hebrew scriptures and on into the apostolic. Now look what happens. For the covenant to go forward, Abraham had one last major problem to perform. 
make sure that his son Isaac was married to a member of his clan. Let me say it this way. I've said this before, too, regarding my parents. My parents, I think, did a great job in many ways. They weren't perfect, but I think they were decent parents. But they had this mentality. Tell me if this sounds familiar. Get good education so you can get good job, so you can make good money, and if you have good money, you'll be happy. Okay, that's the basic formula. Get a get, you know, good education, nothing wrong with education. So you get a good job, nothing wrong with a good job. So you make good money, nothing wrong with good money, or lots of it, and then you'll be happy. My parents, and I don't, I don't answer this within your own head. Don't, don't, please don't raise any hands. But how many of you, your parents were actively involved in deciding, in the decision you made of the person you married? Don't raise any hands. I'm just asking the question. And I would be willing to wager that most of you, most of you got married without your parents really having much input. So now I'm part of a movement that's saying, you know what? We as parents have not done our job. If we just say, let's raise them up and they're strong in body, they're strong in mind, they have education, and they, they go to school and they get degrees and then they get a nice job because here's the truth of the matter the person you marry has an impact on the rest of your life and if we leave marriage to to just the kids and say well you know what just go out there and find somebody good luck you know who they'll marry they'll marry a Canaanite and then we'll wonder why they're building Asherah poles in the backyard And again, we have syncretism. So we have good, good Christian parents who raise their children to fear God, send them off to college, get them, they get a good job, all these things, and then this person marries a person who is not a believer. They're unequally yoked. They marry a Canaanite, in essence, to put it in the biblical terminology. And then the kids that they produce are also Canaanites. And then they say, well, he or she says, well, can I bring him to, to church with me? Well, no, I really don't want you doing that. Well, I was raised this, and you were raised that, so what are we going to do? Or I was raised, I didn't even have any faith. If we as parents, and now I'm going to include grandparents, if we as parents or grandparents don't work with our children and grandchildren to make sure that they marry somebody who is godly. We have not done them all of the service that we were supposed to. Marrying a person who is godly is one of the responsibilities, helping your children marry a person who is godly, is one of the responsibilities of parenthood. It's not just enough, because look what happens. If, if you just say, okay, it's education, it's, they're physically fit, they're emotionally fit, and they get out there, and here's what happens. Then they run into a culture that says, that says, play the field. Have fun for a while. Yeah. Sow so your wild oats. Have relationships. Have multiple relationships. You know, go out with this one, go out with that one. Don't tie yourself down. If you want to have relations with them, that's fine too. As long as you don't get caught and nobody gets pregnant, we're all good. And then eventually you'll settle down with somebody. And let's just hope that when all that happens, there's no emotional scars. Well, wrong. There are emotional scars. There's a lot of emotional scars. And then people do end up pregnant. And kids are born into this situation. Our congregation supports right here in Gig Harbor CareNet. The last, the last shower we did, and these were for girls we didn't even know. Check the ages out. 14, 15, and 16. I talked with a school teacher 
who says she deals with 9 and 10 year olds. They're getting bombarded in her class with sexuality. This is 9 and 10. It's not getting any better. She's a public school teacher saying she has problems with her 9 and 10 year olds in her class because they're bombarded with sexuality. Now the question is, what do we as parents do? So I'm saying, look, as a Messianic community, one of the messages we have to have is for both parents and grandparents to think in terms of how do we help make sure that the children we have marry well and do well with the person that they become involved with for the rest of their life. Because if not, then we're going to have cyclical divorces. And if they have practiced... If they have practiced idolatry and have practiced immorality, then they carry it into a marriage, and what happens? Eventually the marriage collapses. I shouldn't have to say to all of us, it should be patently obvious, and this is what our Torah text today is about. Abraham says, look, if this promised seed is going to go forward, I don't want it going forward by my son Isaac marrying a Canaanite. We need to make sure that he marries somebody who's godly. Now we find Rivka, or Rebecca, by a well, and she's out there getting water. I said it this way before, too. The older I've gotten, the less I'm impressed with smart people, the more I'm impressed with people who are kind. We've lost, the, we've lost the idea of kindness, which I think is a godly trait. We've lost the idea of kindness. And Eliezer says, Lord, he prays. This, he's the first one in the Bible we have that prays and asks God for something. And he says, God, I want you to help me find a wife for my servant Isaac. And here's how I'll know that it's the right one. She'll ask me if she can get me some water. She'll show kindness to a stranger. This will be the telltale sign that it's the right one. Hey, guys and gals, if they can't be kind to people they don't know, be careful about entering into long-term relations with them. If they have no kindness to people they don't even know, that's a telltale sign. Is Do they, ha do they show kindness to somebody they don't even know? And she goes even above and beyond... Not only does she show kindness to Eliezer, who's a foreigner, she says, can I water your camels as well? No small feet. And he says, that's got to be the one. That's the one. God says, yeah, that's the one. But she's willing to serve a foreigner, a stranger. And not only does she care about, not only does she care about him, she has concern for his animals. I've, all, I've been saying this before, too. Watch how people treat animals. Watch how people treat animals. That'll be, that's a telltale clue how they'll treat another human being. All the way through the scriptures. Watch how a person treats animals. It'll tell you how they are going to treat another human being. Every one of the, almost everyone, almost every one of the serial killers, once they're interviewed, they say, where did you get started killing things? So I got started, I took the neighbor's cat, then I took our cat, and then I took, I started killing all these animals. And I, I got away with it, and so I, I found joy and pleasure in watching life ebb out of something that was living. And then I just graduated to human beings. Now I've done three, four, five, six, seven, eight, or nine of those. Oh, okay. We had a clue when all these animals went missing. Yes. 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 For, for those of you in that, you know, watch how, yeah, watch how a son relates to his mother. Watch how a mother, and watch how a, a daughter relates to her father. Good indicators. Not always. There's some exceptions. I'll give you an example. We had one, one young lady. I told, you, I told you that in order for me to do a marriage ceremony, that the parents, I always should get the father's consent. I always want the father to sign off that he is releasing his daughter to this man. I had one young lady come to me, and I did her wedding. But her father was, I'll just put it this way, he was problematic. He was doing and dealing drugs. Now that messes a kid up. 
And yet, you know what she did? She honored her father by going to him and asking, can I have your permission? And he gave it to Mary, and, and I, did the, I did the wedding ceremony. But she came to me, and she said to me, because I told her, I said, I won't do this ceremony unless your father consents. And she says, I don't even know if I can find my father. I don't even know where he's at. He's, he's always doing drugs or, or selling them. Wow. So, look, I know that we live in an imperfect world where there's a lot of difficulties. And some of you as spouses, you know what I'm talking about when I say this, some of you, as, as you, you've overcome a lot to be where you are today. You or your spouse have overcome a lot because of where your parents were. You had a lot of hurdles to get over. Corey works at Discovery High School, which is in Port Orchard. What an interesting place to, to see some kids. And you know what? You look at these kids, and you see, what the, you see what they're having to deal with with their parents. And sometimes the parents, no wonder the kids are messed up, and they're actually doing quite well when you look at what the parents are. And you think the nut doesn't fall far from the tree because these parents are so messed up. So, I, look, I, I realize we live in a, in a messed up world where things aren't always what they're supposed to be and where even parents are, to put it mildly, problematic. But I'm saying, look, if we can, now, this is why as grandparents, let's say maybe, maybe things didn't go the way you wanted it to with your kids. There are some of you that are just starting out. There are some of you that are married and, and you have younger kids. And there's some, we have everybody on the spectrum here. So I'm trying to say and speak to everybody to say, hey, look, no matter where you are on the spectrum, grandparent, parent with young children, no children, wherever you are on that spectrum, think in terms of, as grandparents, as parents, wherever you are, that you want to help your young people not only be physically and emotionally and spiritually healthy, but you want them to marry somebody. You want to be a part of the process of helping them on the path to, to godliness by marrying a person who elevates them to be godly. You want the person they marry to elevate their game and make them a better person. You want to marry a godly person. And there's some of you in here, you've been divorced, and you, know, you realize that the person you married wasn't a godly person. They weren't even close to godly. Got married for all the wrong reasons. God understands that this happens, and divorce happens. We know it happens. And yet, you want to make sure that the person you remarry is a person that's godly. Don't make the same mistake twice. I told you one time I had a lady I was dealing with, and I said to her, she'd already been married twice before. I said, well, I understand you're getting remarried. She said, yes. And I said, well, is the person you're going to marry a believer? She says, no. I said, well, why are you even considering marrying this guy? It doesn't make any sense. You've already, twice before this has not gone well. Why do you think that a third time of marrying a non-believer is going to go well? Well, we're in love. You want to marry somebody and you want your children to marry somebody that elevates their game, that makes them a better person, that pushes them to be everything that God wants them to be that doesn't say to them, that doesn't mock them if they want to read their Bible, that doesn't mock them if they want to go to church, that doesn't cause all kinds of hindrances and problems. And one of the things we look for, when you look for is godliness. Now, Rivka is good looking. Nothing wrong with that. She's a, but you know what? In the scriptures, it's what's interesting. And she's moral. It says she'd never known a man. She's got kindness to strangers, kindness to animals, and she's been morally pure. It's not a bad combo. And on top of all that, she's decent looking, the text says. But let me tell you what. Beauty is skin, truly skin deep. Ugly goes all the way to the bone. Ugly will go all the way to the bone. And let me say it this way, guys. Let me say it this way, just to talk to the guys and those coming up and everybody. You know what? You'd be better off marrying a seven that's godly than a ten that's ungodly. 
Well, you know what? Because here's what's going to happen. For everybody in this room, looks are going to fade. Looks are going to fade. But the character of the person, if they're truly godly, will remain. Or increase. They should be continually increasing in faith and godliness. That's the person you want to marry. That says, you know what? I want to put God first in my life. I want, to be, I want his commandments to be the charter of my, of my life. That's, the, that's what you want. And I can say, I can say this, that I've said this too to you guys. That, you know, I couldn't do what I do if it wasn't for my wife. She elevates my game. And I think she's truly a better person than me. I think she makes me a better person. Tries anyway. I'm still a work in progress, believe me. I said across, I said it this week, God is my witness, I said across from my mother-in-law and my father-in-law, and they were saying, so, you know, how's, you know how are you guys doing? How's your marriage? We're talking about marriage. And I said, you know what? The, the biggest problems in my marriage came from me. My selfishness, my issues. It's, you know, I'm an ongoing, I'm an ongoing project. But I married a person who I think elevates me to be a better person. And who wants me to be better. And who works to make me better. To, tries to knock off the rough edges. And there are plenty of those. But I'm better for being with her because she makes me a better person. And that's what I want every person in here to marry a person that makes you a better person. That, the, that they, they truly want to see you become everything that God wants you to become. And they don't stand in your way to become godly. They elevate you to be who God wants you to be. And, they, and, and how we know, we look for things like this. Kindness to animals. Kindness to strangers. Moral purity. Those are, those are just kindness. Gentle, gentleness and kindness. Those are good qualities. That tells you you're moving in the right direction. And she's got good family that's trying to help her out. All right, I've talked long enough. Your, your turn. Your insights. Yes. Anyone? Sorry. Anyone? Not all at once, yes. Yeah, go ahead. Right. Yes. Yes, he is. And, yes. Uh, I can say that in, in my life, my mother said to me, I hope your marriage worked out better than the marriage that I had to your father, which wasn't even in existence when she said that. It was long ago. And uh, she had little input into my um, discernment to marry Jolene, and my father had even less. But wasn't long after that I became a Christian and really understood what love is. I was 15. I thought, if God reaches out to me and brings me into a relationship with him where I truly know what love is, well then what's to stop him from helping me to find my wife who will be another expression of God's love? Mm -hmm. Yes. Who went ahead yes. And was my yes. And God does that. God does that miraculously and does that sovereignly. And those are those are excellent, excellent things. I think many many of us, as God's children, He has protected along the way. Many. Um, you know, Abraham says to this servant, "You know, yes, you. I can't do this physically. Go on this journey. I want you to do it." This, this servant prays to God and asks for God's help. And, you know, the, and parents involved in this process have to ask for God's help as well. They have to submit to God as well along this process. Um, but I think when, you know, when, it's always nice, though, when parents can be involved. Because here's the truth. You marry into a family. You think that you're just marrying that person. But that person is the product of a family. 
and potentially for the rest of that marriage, you're going to have to relate to the rest of that family. So there's a bigger picture here sometimes. So, I mean, I'm, you know, Dr. Bob's absolutely right. You know what? God does sovereignly superintend in many situations. And there's many of us that can attest that he's covered a lot of our tracks. We made some really foolish mistakes and God said, all right, I'll cover it. I'm going to help you out. But that doesn't excuse us from coming back to wisdom and saying, you know what, we still, God, I'm glad you were there all along covering a lot of these mistakes. But, but wisdom says, we, you know, God gave us parents, honor your father and mother. And so the parents, if they're godly parents, that's a big key, if they're godly parents, should be involved in the process and should help their children in the process and say to them, you know what, maybe you say something like this. Are you sure that this person you're hanging around, that you're associating with, is a godly person? Psalm 1 says this. You know, you sit in the council of the Rishaim, the wicked. You sit in the council of the Kataim, the, those who missed the mark. Or you sit in the council of the Leitzim, those who are scoffers. So, maybe, you're some, maybe sometimes love, love gets in the way. And parents can be objective to say, you know what, this may or may not be the right person for you. Knowing you, and say, you know what, this is, I just did a wedding last Shabbat afternoon, later in the afternoon. And both sets of parents were there. It was a beautiful wedding. And both sets of parents said, I think that this person, the, the one that my son is marrying and my daughter is marrying, both sets said, you know, this person is going to make them a better person. And they're starting out with both families supportive. You want both families to support. It's a good thing when all the families are on board and supporting. It's a good thing. Oh, yeah, go ahead. No, you're right. Start praying now. Yes. Yes. Start praying now for your, for your children and your grandchildren, saying, God, I pray that you will direct the path, that you will open the heart of my child, that they will know that the person that you have chosen for them, and that, you know, that this will work out, Lord, to, that things will be what they should be. Start praying now. That's a great thing to do. And then, when you as a grandparent, and I had a number of grandparents here, look, when you have your grandchildren with you, say, you know what, here's some good qualities in your parents. They, and, and Try to help your grandchildren be obedient to their parents. And say, you know what? Your parents will probably not be perfect because I wasn't a perfect parent, but they love you and they want the best for you. And if you listen to them, they'll help guide you. They want God's best for you. And then you tell them the kind of characteristics that are godly as well. And model for them what a godly mother is and what a godly father is. That's what we've got to have. Starts, yeah, it starts. So I'm saying I realize we have a spectrum here. But I think for everybody on this spectrum, there's a message in this that says, you know what? We know that marriages are huge and important because it sets the trajectory of your life. There's no more, other than your decision to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, to use that language, other than your faith decision, other than your faith decision, the, yes, Yeshua, accepting Yeshua's kingdom, yes, thank you. Other than that decision, the next major decision you make that sets the trajectory of your life is the person you marry. Every one of us knows that. Anybody in here that's been married, you know that the person you marry sets the trajectory for your life. They can either be for you or against you. It can be, it can be a struggle or it can be easy going. Based on, you know, based on the person you marry. And they can, they can make life easy or they can make life difficult. So I'm trying to say, look, I, you know, I want to help us to make, make it good for our kids so that when th that they marry somebody who sets them on a trajectory to live a life of faith. So that's where we're at, and that's what I'm talking about, is say, how do, we, how do we help our children to know the qualities to look for in another person? To say, hey, look, I don't want a person, we've been studying this in the Psalms, I don't want a person who's a Rishaim. I don't want a person who's 
always missing the mark. I don't want to marry a person who's always scoffing and mocking God. I want to marry a person who meditates in his Torah day and night, and in his Torah, he finds pleasure. That's the kind of person. Yes. Well, It's, it's beautiful, though, when we have... Yes, I agree. It's, Dr. Bob's correct. It's, it's beautiful when we have the grace of God that overrides in situations where we don't have godly parents. But if we have godly parents who are concerned and care and are compassionate and want to be involved, you've got to start that involvement early, mind you. But you know, talking to your kids, and then later on, let's say you did make a mistake with your kids, then talk to your grandkids and, and begin the process all over again. And say, you know what, we want to start with our grandkids and, and move them in the right directions. Telling them the, the, the values and the, and the things that they should look for. So, you know, we, we have, God gives us a, a second chance and a third chance at times. And so we can, we can pick up the pieces and, and move forward. But you're right, we have a responsibility to, be, to, to try to do the godly thing as best we can. Yes. Right. Yes. Right. And I'm not even I'm not even arguing for I'm not even arguing necessarily for arranged marriages. I'm, that's not my point. But I'm arguing for parent parental involvement that they at least that they are at least involved in the process to say this is a godly person, not a godly person, and maybe this is not the right one or is is the right one confirmation, affirmation, or the other direction to say, you know, maybe you ought to rethink this before you get deeply involved with this person. And I think we need to say to our kids also that, I'm gonna, I want to end with this, the, I, it's my opinion, and I'm just going to throw this out to you, that the whole dating scene where you go out, you give your heart away, you give your emotions, and then you get dumped. Then you go out, you give your heart, your emotions, you go out, and then you get dumped. There's a dumpy, dumper and a dumpy. And if it wasn't for this process, we wouldn't have 95% of the country songs out there. Because you've got to have all this dump and dumpy. Okay? But here's what happens. Eventually in this process, eventually in this process, as you're giving your emotions away, and giving your emotional investment and energy into this relationship, you give your body away. And then you get into this cycle of relationship dumped, relationship dumped. And then here's what happens. Then you get married. And the cycle just continues. We just change the nomenclature. Now it becomes divorce. But the cycle had already started in the dating process of just going out, giving your body away, and then getting dumped. Going out, give your body away, get dumped. And then you get married. And you bring all of this emotional baggage into a marriage. It was, it's my belief that God never intended for us to enter marriage with emotional or sexual baggage. That one man would be with one woman for one lifetime, and that would be the only person they knew. I know that sounds crazy. Even as I say it, I sound, I, I, saying it out loud, I sound, it sounds crazy. It sounds, yeah, it sounds far-fetched. 
but I really do believe that God wanted one man with one woman for one lifetime, barring death. And that, that you would, they would both enter it with moral purity, and the only person they would ever know would be that person.